Yes, it's, oh, there we go. I'm coming through now. Thank you very much. Let me just set all my technology up. So that's one of the advantages, really, of uh, doing the video and everything, is that if you don't cheer, oh, I'm going to clap and laugh at the right bits. I can just edit it in. I'll add some cheers here, here and there. So yeah, I haven't spoken for quite a while, actually. Um, so some of you may know that I'm doing a theology course part-time. And ever since I started doing the course, Gareth asked me whether I'd be willing to share some of the things that I'm learning. And I felt God was pushing me recently to do just that. So here I am, following on from Sue, um, starting this off on the, being a holy nation, a royal priesthood, looking at Exodus. And then Gareth last week looked at uh, 1 Peter. And we were talking earlier, or Rob was talking earlier about God having a sense of humor. I definitely think he does, because after me feeling pushed to preach, Gareth gives me revelation. <laughs> so I'm really chuffed, as you can imagine. But it's not too bad. So a bit of a recap. So Sue spoke about us being a holy nation and a royal priesthood, um, and how Israel in the Old Testament were called to be a holy nation. Back in those days, as Sue's mentioned to us, um, they had a priest, and the priest was an mediator between the people and God. He would do that act of sacrifice on behalf of the people. And then Gareth spoke last week about um, Jesus coming and him being the ultimate sacrifice, and in the fact that he did the sacrifice on our behalf, that we no longer need to do that sacrificial act um, that they used to do in the Old Testament because Jesus has done it for us. And what we need to do is to be obedient to God and obedient to Jesus. Hopefully that was a good recap of what Gala spoke about last week. Thumbs up. Yes, here we go. But before we start, I'd like to tell you a true story. Now, my friends and family will tell you if I start a sentence with, I'm going to tell you a true story, chances are there's a punchline at the end. However, if you laugh at the end, that's on you. I've told you it's a true story. And then if you don't laugh at the end, then I will definitely say it's a true story and it wasn't a joke, and then we're all fine. So I've got two friends, Betty and Graham. Betty and Graham, um, salt of the earth, lovely people. And Betty comes home from work after a long day, and she decides I'm going to put the television on, and I'm going to have a cup of tea. So she comes home, turns the telly on, and it flashes up. Breaking news, warning for drivers. On the A483, there's a man driving the wrong way down the A483, causing havoc, driving 70 miles an hour, and it's causing chaos everywhere. Betty's a bit concerned because she knows that this is the route that Graham drives home. So she rings him up. Graham answers, hello! I said, Graham, you better be really careful on the way home because there's someone driving the wrong way down the motorway. And the news is telling you to be careful in the way that you drive. So you might want to take a different route. I said, oh, love, you're going to have to tell them to update the news. Why? There's not just one of them. There's hundreds of them. <laughs> it was Graham. Graham was driving the wrong way. Just in case you didn't get it. We've got a picture of Graham, I think. There he is. <laughs> My friend Graham. <laughs> okay, so we're looking at Revelation. Now, you'll be happy to know I'm not doing a really in-depth um, dive into Revelation. But when I've been looking at Revelation and when I've been um, reading it and various studies that I've done looking at, it's not meant to be as scary as we always feel that it is. With Revelation... Back in the old days, in the original Greek, Revelation translated to Apocalyptus. And the Apocalyptus in the um, part of the play or the theatre was the part where they'd do the big unveiling. So they'd have a part of the show where um, people weren't sure what was going on. And then at a certain point throughout the show, they would do the Apocalyptus. They would lift the veil and they would um, show all and reveal all. And that would be the moment where everyone went, Ah, oh, right, okay, that makes sense. And that's the whole point of Revelation. Revelation is meant to be a revealing, it's meant to be a, the veil being lifted off so that we can understand what's going to be happening in the future. The problem is, is that this was written in a way that made sense back in the day. So people that were theatre goers back in the day was written in that kind of speech, and there's parallels in some of the visions back to the Old Testament. So it made sense back then. The problem is, is that we don't fully understand without doing lots of um, research what the different um, visions 
actually meant. So we have to delve a bit deeper. So I'd imagine if Revelation was written today, it'd be emojis, GIFs, memes, and we would really understand it. I'd, I'd like to say I understand it. I'm not as hip as I used to be, especially when I see the way my daughter texts. Some of the abbreviations she puts in, I haven't got a clue what they are. I just, I'm still stuck on lol and ruffle. Rolling on the floor laughing, if you don't know. Okay. So um, let's have a look then at the passage that I've been asked to look at this morning. So we, first of all, we're looking at Revelation 1, 5 to 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And can we have the second one, please, as well? And then the second one is, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God's persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. So as I mentioned um, previously, in the Old Testament um, and in the early days of Israel, they had a priest and the priest would be the one that would perform the sacrifice on behalf of the people in order to reconcile people's sins with God. Jesus coming along, he becomes that sacrifice so that we no longer need to have that priest going into the temple in order to do the sacrifice on our behalf. The important thing, as I had in my first slide, I don't know if you noticed it, it was meant to be like a veil being torn apart. And the whole idea was was that when Jesus came and he sacrificed himself on our behalf through the love of God, the veil was torn in two. That access to God was freed up. We were able to have that access through Jesus by having a relationship with him. In Revelation, it's essentially echoing what Gareth was looking at last week on um, 1 Peter. We're called to be a people who live our lives for God. We're called to be a people who follow Jesus and follow his example, and in doing so, can bring other people to God. The fact that um, the veil has been torn in two means that it's opened it up for everyone. And what I like about, I think it's on the second one. Can we go to the second one, please? Sorry. This is the bit I really like. So you purchased from God persons from every tribe, every language, and people, and nation. So it's not like the Old Testament where the people of Israel had a special relationship with God and had a special access to God. Everyone has got that access. The sad thing is, is that not everyone maybe wants to have that access to God or they don't know about it. So... What does it mean for us today as a people who are trying to follow God and trying to follow in Jesus' example? So personally, I can't speak for all of you, but personally, I try and be a good Christian in every situation that I'm in. So I try and be a consistent Christian is the thing I've always got in the back of my head. I need to try and be a consistent Christian. So I don't try and be a different person in church to who I am in work or who I am around my friends. Rob used to be my boss, so hopefully he could vouch that the person I am here isn't different to the person I am in work. I try not to be anyway. There is one place that I really struggle to be a Christian or that I don't portray myself as being a very good Christian. So I'm going to pull up some um, quotes. These quotes are stuff that I've actually said. I'm ashamed that I've said them, but see if you can work out where I may have said them. Can we have the first one, please? You're not a tank. Next one. You can fit three of you through there. Christmas is coming. Any time today. What do you think you're doing? This is one of my favorites, actually, even though I'm not proud of it, but it's, it's a cork of a line. Don't worry about your indicators. I've got my crystal ball with me. <laughs> Any ideas where I am? In the car, yeah. So I, I turn into a beast in the car. It's horrible. It's really horrible, and I feel ashamed of myself when I'm driving around and I'm saying these really unkind things. And then it, the, one of the things that I often think about is imagine we were here in the corridor now at the end of church and I started talking like this in, the, in there. 
where someone's taking a little bit too long to get through the door, and I went, come on, you're not a tank, come on. You'd be totally offended, while in the car, all of a sudden, it's acceptable to say those things. So I've really struggled with that as a challenge for myself to alter my behavior in the way that I'm driving. And one day, it dawned on me, I was driving around, um, and I, I was in a foul mood in the car. Funny thing is, outside the car, I'm fine. Get in the car, foul mood. Get into work, and I'm fine. For some reason, I'd get into the car, and I'd be spouting all these things. And I had a thought, not everyone that I'm encountering, it can't be that everyone I'm encountering as I'm driving around is in the wrong. It can't be that every single person is in the wrong. And I used to think to myself, oh, there must be a full moon, or there's a bad driver convention in town. But it can't be. So I had to take a step back and think, what is the common denominator in my day? And it was me. I'm the common denominator. I'm the one that's getting annoyed. I'm the one that's frustrated. So I need to look at the way that I'm behaving. And then it also is a case of looking at, is this how Jesus wants me to behave? I come to church and I'm the person that sits at the back doing the PA, and I try and be nice to everyone. I go to work, I try and be kind and loving to everyone. In the car, I'm not kind and loving, and it's not the way Jesus wants me to teach, uh, t- wants me to behave. And it doesn't say in the Bible that you're allowed to follow Jesus in every single way, apart from when you're behind the wheel. You've got to do it all the time. So I think the challenge for me personally is making sure that I'm consistent and that I'm showing love in everything I do. Sometimes there are days where I struggle or I'm having um, a tough time or I'm feeling a bit down, and I'm sure everyone feels those days. And I tend to find on those days, those are the hardest days. When something's bothering you, it's really hard to get out of that mindset and to get yourself into that loving frame of mind. But then if you flip it on the side, if you imagine a time where Um, maybe you're about to go on holiday or you're about to see some friends you haven't seen for a while or some family or you're coming home on a Friday and you've got that Friday feeling. There's not a lot that can bring me down in those areas. When I'm really excited about something, I'm in a really good place. So I find it a lot easier to be a Christian. But one of the things that we've got as Christians is a certain hope. Can we take those quotes down? Because it's going to detract from (laughs) the love I'm trying to portray and it's called, you're not a tank. Um, the one thing that we've got as Christians is a certified hope in Jesus. We know from John 3.16 that Jesus loves us. God loves us. They gave us Jesus. And if we have a relationship with Jesus, we will live forever. And we will be with Jesus forever. We will be with God forever. And we've got that hope that being a Christian is easy because it's actually really hard. It can be really hard to be a Christian sometimes. But one of the things that I I take part from is I'm actually quite glad that sometimes I find things hard. I'm glad that um, we get to experience some of the hardships that there are around the world because if we didn't have these hardships and we didn't find it a struggle, we wouldn't know how to relate with people. We wouldn't know how to build those relationships with people, break the barriers that they've got to heal themselves and to heal their hearts. We won't know the pain that they're going through. So it's a good thing that we, we can experience it, but what we do have is a hope in Jesus that it'll never go away. We were talking about it earlier that there's nothing that we can do will make Jesus love us more. There's nothing we can do that'll make Jesus love us less. He fills us with love. What we need to be doing is living our lives in a way that God's love is pouring out of us. It's overflowing from us in everything that we're doing so people can see that there's something different in our lives. Now, I wasn't here last week. I was at um, Comic-Con. So some of you know, uh, in, my part, in my spare time, I go and do it's a pop culture convention, um, and I go out with lots of my friends, and we have a really good time. We get to meet some celebrities. So it's all good. Um, but after every event that we do, we have an after-show party. And when we were going to this after-show party, um, it was about half nine. Um, I was arriving a little bit late because it's good to be casually late. I didn't want to be the first one there. I didn't want to be the last one, so I kind of cruised in a little bit cool. Well, I thought I was cool anyway. But as I was walking in, there was a um, homeless man on the side asking for change. And in the digital age, I do everything on my phone now. I don't ever have change. If 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 On the rare occasion, I might have my card on me, but um, unfortunately... 
didn't have any change on me. And I was walking past him and I said, sorry, I don't have any change, but can I see if there's a coffee machine in the bar that we're in? And he said, yeah, that'd be lovely. So I went in and I got him a coffee, came out and gave it to him. The thing that really shocked me was that there was a bit of a ripple effect around where we were having the after show. Lots of people had seen me giving the coffee to this homeless man and they were all talking about it and everyone's coming, well, not everyone, lots of people were coming up to me and saying, why did you buy him a coffee? Why would you do that? And what surprised me is the amount of people that were more shocked at the fact that I'd given him a coffee than the fact that he was outside and that he was alone, that he was cold, it was raining, so he wasn't in a very good position. And there's not enough love around in the world. People are shocked by acts of kindness. Now, for me, that's not something I always do. I do try and be um, kind, and if I do see someone homeless, I do try and do what I can for them. I take the example from Noah, um, every time I've seen Noah see someone homeless, he will want to do something for them, get them a sandwich, get them a drink. And it's that act of love that we need to be performing. That's the way that Jesus wants us to behave. And it's not that I did anything spectacular. And I'm not saying it for me to get the credit because it was a simple act of love. But that's what we should be doing in our daily lives. We should be showing an example to people on what Jesus wants us to do. With the world and with the people that we interact with and in work, in school, in our daily lives, there's, there's so much hate in the world, there's so much anger in the world, there's so much anxiety in the world. It's really easy to get sucked into it. But also there's love, there's kindness, there's hope in Jesus that is a hope that we can hold strong and keep within us to help us through these difficult times. And I would just... I want to pray for all of you, if any of you are going through a tough time or any of you are struggling with anything, whether it's pain, whether it's anxiety, when it's loss, Jesus is there and he loves you and he's got his arms around you and he wants to know you. We need to be showing our friends and family the love that we have in Jesus. We need to be showing our friends and family what having Jesus in our lives actually means and the difference it makes in our lives. When I'm driving around calling people, all sorts in the car, that is not showing Jesus' love. That is showing his annoyance at life. And no one needs to see that. So if you could take anything away from what I've said today, we were talking earlier about um, me being the common denominator of negativity in my life. And I think there's lots of people that could relate to that. Whether It might not just be driving in the car, but you might have things that annoy you, that bring out the worst in you. Don't let anger, annoyance, anxiety, pain be the common denominator in your life. If you want good examples of ways to live, look at the fruits of the Spirit. Kindness, faithfulness, self-control, love, peace, joy. Let them be the common denominators in your life. Let Jesus be the common denominator in your life. His love is amazing. His grace is fantastic. Every day, I'm thankful for what I've got in the world that we live in. Do I find things hard? Yes. Is the world a horrible place? Yes, it can be. But it's also a beautiful place. And Jesus is there with us every step of the way. It's not fair for us to hold the gospel to ourselves. It's not fair for us to hold that love to ourselves. We need to be sharing it. And I'm not telling you you have to go outside and evangelize in a way that doesn't suit you. Street evangelism doesn't work for everyone, but everyone can do peer-to-peer -peer evangelism. Everyone can show love to your friends, to your neighbors, random acts of kindness that just show God love. Let's pray, Lord. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you that you are an amazing God. Your love is overwhelming at times, and life can be really hard. But this entire service, we've been looking at love. We've been singing about love. We've been singing about you and how amazing you are. Lord, we lift you up and we pray that you overflow from our lives, that we can go around our day showing people your love and that people will see a difference in us and that they question why are we different. And that we can tell them it's because we love you and we have you in our lives. You were the sacrifice. You gave us Jesus so that we can have that relationship with you. The veil's been torn in two. We have unlimited access to you, Lord. 
through Jesus. And that's just amazing. We just thank you for everything that you do for us. And I pray that you bless us this week and bless us as we go away from church and that you help us see the good and see the love that you have for us in our lives and help us when we are struggling, when we are finding it hard, when the days are tough, that we can draw on you for our strength. Just guide us in our weeks as we go along, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.